fans are pumped about the 2022 NFL Draft. It seems like everybody's praising what the Jets' front office did, but these selections are not good news for everybody. We are going to discuss the players on the Jets' roster most impacted by their draft picks on today's episode of the Locked On Jets podcast. You are Locked On Jets, your daily New York Jets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome. This is the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It's Tuesday, May 3rd, 2022, and I'm your host, John B. from gangreennation.com, and I thank you for making the show your first listen or your first watch every day. We're free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. If you like what you see or hear, hit that subscribe button. If you're watching on YouTube, please give this episode a big thumbs up. It helps the channel out, and it helps other Jets fans find Locked On Jets. Well, if you are a Jets fan, you are probably very excited today. The Jets came away from the 2022 NFL Draft with four of the top 36 picks. They made seven picks in the first four rounds, and they are receiving universal praise. The draft grades experts are giving out are straight A's. It feels like maybe there's a light at the end of the tunnel after a decade plus of really bad football. There's some hope. We have a lot of young talent coming in. But the draft is not good news for everybody. There are always players who are replaced by draft picks. And on today's episode, we're going to talk about the players on the Jets roster most impacted by the players they drafted this year. So let's begin by talking about the fourth overall pick, Sauce Gardner. And there's a pretty clear loser from this pick, and that's Bryce Hall. And it's kind of unfortunate because I do not think Bryce Hall did anything to deserve losing his starting role, but that's probably what's going to happen. Now, there are fans who are speculating, is he going to move to free safety? I mean, we'll see about that. The Jets have not indicated that they're ready to move Hall to safety. In fact, if you've listened to some of the rumors from the beat writers, it sounds like they did not love Hall that much last season, even though I thought he played pretty well. And the general consensus is that Bryce Hall showed he's a starting caliber corner. So I don't know how much that played into the selection of Sauce Gardner. My view is that Sauce Gardner was just viewed as such an exceptional talent that the Jets felt like they could not pass on him. And beyond that, this selection turns the Jets into a a team that has a very imposing group of corners, which they did not have before between Sauce Gardner and DJ Reed. But there's no doubt this is going to send Bryce Hall to the bench. And I don't think Bryce Hall really deserves to go to the bench. I think he's a starting caliber corner. Now, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world because now you have incredible depth at the corner position. You have a guy who's a starting caliber corner who's going to be coming off the bench for you. So if anything happens, if you suffer an injury, you got a guy you know you can rely on, a guy with good starting experience. And I mentioned this last week. This was a this was a line Rex Ryan used when he was the coach of the Jets. On the defensive side of the ball, no position loses you games quicker through bad play than the corner position. So you want to have as many good corners as you possibly can. Now you have a very high-end corner in Sauce Gardner, or at least a, a high-end prospect in Sauce Gardner, across from DJ Reed, who's a good corner in his own right, who the Jets brought in in free agency. And you have Bryce Hall coming off the bench. You also have Brandon Eccles coming off the bench, although Eccles was kind of relegated to the bench by the signing of DJ Reed. So it's a good situation for the Jets because last year's starters are this year's backups. So you've got these guys experience last year, and you know you can count on, especially Bryce Hall, Brandon Eccles is more of a backup caliber corner, but now you have a, a starting caliber corner as your backup. It's not a bad thing for the Jets. It's a bad thing for Bryce Hall, though, a guy who really did nothing to deserve losing his job. And I've heard people suggest beyond moving him to safety, I've heard people suggest, why don't the Jets look to trade him? And I say, well, why would you want to trade him? I mean, listen, if somebody, if some team's going to offer a crazy deal for Bryce Hall, then I could see it. But I don't understand why you'd be willing to give up quality, a quality player who's cheap and gives you good depth at a very important position. Corner is one of those spots I feel like you can never have too much talent. So, I, I think this is this is a really good thing for the Jets, that the fact you have a guy like Bryce Hall as a backup. It's not good for Bryce Hall, though, and he's obviously the player most impacted by this selection. Now we go to the wide receiver position. This one was a little tricky because the Jets did not really have a lot of depth at the receiver position, and I don't think anybody thought they were going to count on a guy like Jeff Smith. And I guess you could say Braxton Berrios might be the guy because now he's going to be a backup but I always felt like Berrios' role was going to be kind of a gadget guy, you know, somebody 
you can get the ball to in space, and then he'd handle the returns, and he'd be a, he'd be the first guy off the bench in terms of an injury. I, you know, I don't think Barrios is that impacted. The guy I guess I think is the most impacted by the selection of Garrett Wilson at 10 is Denzel Mims from the standpoint that, and maybe it's not that great of an impact because it seems like the coaching staff had already kind of given up on him. But if the Jets had not added a receiver in the draft, there was at least like a plausible pathway to Denzel Mims maybe rejuvenating his career. We all know what a disaster this last season was. After a rookie season that saw him miss the first half due to multiple hamstring injuries and then look kind of promising in the second half and raising expectations, Mims' second season was a catastrophe. I mean, there's no other way to put it. I think most of us were expecting him to be a a starter for the Jets last year. I think a lot of us were looking for him to have a breakout year. Instead, he had a year where he caught eight passes. He's now two years into his career. He doesn't have a touchdown catch. I mean, this is just looking like a complete bust. And Mims is only path to rejuvenating his career was the Jets not making a move at receiver, maybe him coming in and surprising everybody in training camp, maybe earning a role. And that opportunity is really gone now because the Jets are kind of full at the receiver position because Corey Davis is coming back. You know, Corey Davis is going to be a starter. You know, Elijah Moore is going to be a starter across from him. You have Garrett Wilson, you have Braxton Berrios. We'll see who plays the slot. You know, maybe the Jets, my, my guess right now is Garrett, you'll see Garrett, a lot of Garrett Wilson in the slot, but maybe the Jets rotate Davis and more in there. There's not really a spot for Denzel Mims. Not that they're, I mean, it was always, it was always kind of a reach to expect Denzel Mims to be able to produce uh, based on what we've seen, because we, we've really not seen a whole lot from him. I mean, we've seen like a couple of decent games in two years and nothing last year. But at the end of last year, if you saw, I mean, if you watch those games, he could not even get lined up correctly. It was, it was, his confidence was completely gone. Denzel Mims, if it's ever going to work for him, is probably going to be a change of scenery that it's going to require. But his ch- there was at least kind of a small pathway for him to find success with this team. And again, I think the coaching staff has given up on him anyway. And the, the drafting of Garrett Wilson is clearly a sign that the coaching staff just doesn't believe in him. With good reason, by the way. I mean, as much as we criticized the coaching staff early last season, and I have to admit I was part of that criticism, they were right about Denzel Mims. He just brought, he did not bring anything to the table last year. And now the, it becomes even more difficult. I mean, the only way you could even conceive of Denzel Mims getting a chance is if the Jets suffer a lot of injuries. And listen, I'm not even sure he's ahead of Jeff Smith on the depth chart because he wasn't by the end of last season. I mean, Denzel, at the, end, the thing is, even though there maybe have maybe it was a plausible pathway, it's like he was behind guys who were practice squad players at the end of last season. So Maybe this doesn't have that great of an impact because the Jets kind of lacked receiver depth, but Denzel Mims would be my choice for the player most impacted by the drafting of Garrett Wilson. Now let's move on to our third first rounder. And again, this is another spot where the Jets kind of had a hole, so maybe the impact isn't as great. And for this player, it's not really a negative impact. There are lots of Jets who are going to be impacted negatively by a certain pick. This is not going to be one of them. It's the selection of Jermaine Johnson where the Jets moved up they moved up from 35 to get back into the first round. I think the guy it impacts, again, not a negative impact, it's more of a utilization impact, is John Franklin Myers. Because we know John Franklin Myers has kind of moved between an interior role and a role on the edge. And my view is that the reason the Jets played John Franklin Myers on the edge so much last year is that he's bigger than your typical defensive end on a, in an even front, a four-man line, you know, I guess whatever a 4-3 defense has become. I think they did that because they wanted to be small and fast at the linebacker position because they could not count on their corners to cover a lot of ground. They essentially tried to constrict the amount of area the corners had to cover. To make up for that, I think they wanted faster linebackers who could cover more ground than your typical linebacker. So essentially, your corners are covering less than your typical corners. To make up for it, your linebackers are covering more than your typical linebackers. Now with Sauce Gardner and DJ Reed in the mix, that changes. You can ask your corners to cover more ground. That means your linebackers have to cover less ground. And that means you can have, maybe your linebackers can play a little bit bigger. And that means you don't necessarily need as big of a defensive line. Because last year when you're playing small linebackers, you need the defensive lineman, big defensive lineman to eat up blocks. If you want your linebackers fast, they have to be smaller. That means they can't get off blocks because they have to be, because they have to be more nimble. They have to be able to cover more ground. This year, if, if your linebackers could be a little bit bigger, you may not need a John Franklin Myers. You may not need a big guy on the defensive end at the defensive end spot. So maybe Franklin Myers slides inside a little bit more, and especially on passing downs, you're going to have a four-man line of Carl Lawson, Quinn and Williams, Franklin Myers on the inside, and then Jermaine Johnson at defensive end. And Jermaine Johnson can play the run. You know, he, he's a pretty well-rounded guy, 
So it, 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 this makes perfect sense to me. It's, it's not like you're losing a lot of run defense. You're maybe losing some size, though, which you don't really need anymore because your linebackers can play bigger because they don't need to cover as much ground. So this all seems very logical to me. I'm not sure that there's a loser because, again, there was kind of a hole on this defensive line. Maybe with Franklin Myers moving inside, Sheldon Rankins loses some snaps. But the impact here is less about who loses playing time. It's more about how John Franklin Myers is, is utilized. And I think that in that way, the Sauce Gardner pick is kind of tied into the Jermaine Johnson pick because when you add corners, your corners can now do more. Your linebackers have to do less. They don't have to run. They don't have to run as fast. They can be bigger, maybe more adept at shedding blocks, which means your defensive line can be more focused on penetration than than eating up space. These things are all tied together, and I think the Jermaine Johnson pick signals kind of a shift in the Jets' defense, which will see John Franklin Myers play more on the inside. So that's how I see the three first round picks impacting the players on the Jets' roster. But of course, the Jets made a couple of picks on day two and I think that there's one player who's going to be replaced who Jets fans are going to be very happy about with one of their day two picks and I'll tell you who that player is ahead here on this Tuesday episode of Locked On Jets. The NFL draft is over all focus will turn to OTAs and minicamp in the NFL but you will not see games until September however the NBA playoffs have begun so have the NHL playoffs and baseball is in full swing and you should know that BetOnline.net is your number one source for all of your sports betting stats and info. Find all of the latest developments, league reviews, and news. Because BetOnline is your continued source for all of your sports wagering information, from live betting to playoffs to esports and more. And even though there are no games to bet on, you can still bet on how the Jets are going to do this season. If you love what they did in the NFL draft, you can take the over and their over-under win totals. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. Bet online, where the game starts. Well, I got to tell you, I think the Jets fan base has certainly been energized by what they did in the NFL draft. But you should know that no business owner wants to deal with the hassle of energy decisions. You just want your business to run smoothly and to pay a fair rate for power. But coming off the back of one of the highest priced winters of the last decade, if your business was on a purely variable or market rate, you paid out the nose. Many New York business owners switched suppliers out of frustration, but unless they chose alternative pricing options, they're still at risk for a January repeat. Catalyst Power partners with you or your trusted energy consultant to produce a power supply plan that fits your business and your market risk tolerance. We have a suite of options customizable for your business's needs, including options that bundle with or focus on renewable energy. Right now in New York, we're offering an on-site solar solution for your business that requires zero installation, maintenance, or material purchase costs. That's right, no CapEx costs for you. To sweeten the deal, qualified businesses could be eligible for up to six months of at-cost energy supply from Catalyst Power. Go to catalystpower.com slash LockedOnJets to learn more. Thank you for making Locked On Jets your first listen or your first watch every day. We are free and available on all platforms. And if you're watching on YouTube and like what you see, please give this episode a big thumbs up. It helps the channel out. Today, we are talking about the players on the Jets roster most impacted by their draft picks. And the next pick the Jets made in the NFL draft after they after their three first round selections was Brees Hall, who they traded up for in the second round. And I think that there was a lot of joy in this pick because... The selection of Brees Hall means that there's one player who I think is out of here. Now, yes, this impacts Michael Carter, who probably moves into more of a complementary role, whereas he was the lead back last year. And that's a good thing, because now you have a complementary back. Your number two back has legitimate number one back skills. So you got depth at the running back position. You're going to be able to run the ball really effectively this year to help Zach Wilson out. But the bigger impact, and you, you can celebrate, because I know nobody wants this guy to play a big role on the Jets roster next year. Biggest impact, I think, is Ty Johnson, who now seems unlikely to make the roster. Ty John, I mean, how many times did you watch Ty Johnson struggle in the passing game last year? How many times did Ty Johnson hurt Zach Wilson because he can't catch a pass? And this, it's not entirely Ty Johnson's fault because the coaching staff, for whatever reason, decided to put him in the third down back role where he was kind of the featured guy in the passing game, even though Michael Carter was better at it. I don't understand it, but I mean, Ty Johnson was the worst receiver. Ty Johnson was one of the worst receiving backs in the NFL last year. And the Jets, for whatever reason, utilized him in a receiving role. And I mean, they'd put him in the slot on, on big plays. They'd have him, he can't pass protect. They'd have him in a pass protection role. And you all know about his hands. I mean, 
Some of the other stuff you may not have noticed. I'm sure if you watched the Jets game last year, you saw that Ty Johnson cannot catch the football. Now you have Brees Hall, who's in the mix. And you have Michael Carter. You have two guys. Your, your tandem is going to be very good at catching the football. And even your third back, who I'm guessing is going to be Tevin Coleman, he's got a reputation for being one of the top receiving backs in all aspects in the NFL. Now he's older. He's probably going to play. He's going to be more of a role player this year. He'll be the third back. He may get a couple of touches a game. If there's a you know an injury, a short-term injury, he may be able to step into the lineup and give you, uh, give you a bigger role for a game or two. But the Jets are now going to be able to catch the football out of the backfield, and they're going to be able to you know do more in the passing game with their backs than they did last year with Ty Johnson. Again, it, maybe it's not all Ty Johnson's fault. He probably should not have been used in the role he was used in. He was obviously he obviously did not have the skills of a receiving back. But sometimes you have to save a coaching staff from itself. You know, sometimes the coaching staff just needs to have a tear player. If the coaching staff is misutilizing a player, sometimes that player just needs to be taken away. And now that you've got Brees Hall and Michael Carter, you're not really going to be tempted to use Ty Johnson on those big plays anymore in the passing game. So Ty Johnson, probably out of here. I imagine that's going to make Jets fans very happy because Ty Johnson became a very unpopular player based on how much he hurt Zach Wilson with his drops last season. Now, late in the third round, of course, the Jets drafted Jeremy Ruckert. To me, the pretty clear loser here is Trayvon Wesco. Wesco was actually drafted at a similar point of the draft in 2019. Now, Wesco was kind of an early early fourth-round pick. Ruckert was a late third-round pick. But I, I think Ruckert is kind of the new developmental tight end. The Jets drafted Wesco. They were hoping he'd kind of develop into like a, that second tight end role. He had a lot of hype around his blocking skills, which I did not think were really justified. I thought Wesco had the potential. Listen, with his size, with his with his willingness to block and willingness is a big deal when you're talking about tight ends lots of tight ends do not come into the nfl as good blockers but you, you see the effort that they show wesco kind of had effort i'm not gonna say he had his moments as a blocker but he never really developed into the dominant blocker the jets were hoping he'd be and i think that's what went into this ruckert pick i think the jets were hoping did the, the jets are hoping ruckert does develop into that quality blocker and like wesco i think coming into the nfl ruckert's a little bit overrated as a blocker but he's got the skills to develop as a blocker However, I think Ruckert has more upside than Wesco as a receiver. And I think we're past the point where you can really hope Wesco is going to be anything more than just a very limited role player. Whereas Ruckert, his potential as a receiver, and which you, you did not really see, you did not, you did not really scratch the surface of his potential as a receiver at Ohio State, in part because he was playing with so many talented wide receivers that they did not feature him in the passing game. But there's clearly more upside with Ruckert this year than there was with Wesco three years ago. So I, I, I would imagine Trayvon Wesco now becomes a long shot to make the team, in part because the Jets also invested heavily at the tight end position in free agency, bringing in C.J. Uzama and Tyler Conklin. And I always felt like this was a perfect year to draft a tight end, maybe round two, especially round three, because a tight, uh, round three tight end is probably not going to be able to contribute on day one. But with these two veterans in, in the mix, you have time to develop him. He can kind of learn on the practice field and maybe take over in a year or two, especially, I'm, I'm assuming C.J. Uzama is not going to be a long-term player with the Jets because of his age. So this gives Rucker time to develop. And maybe the Jets use him situationally as they try and develop him into a blocking tight end. But I think time is clearly up on Trayvon Wesco. And I think it's, in, again, unless there's an injury in training camp, he now faces some difficult odds to make the roster. We've talked about the Jets' day one picks, who they will impact. We've talked about the Jets' day two picks, who they will impact. Which players will be impacted most by the Jets' picks on day three? A couple of third-round picks the Jets recently made could be on the chopping block, and I'll tell you who they are as we continue on this Tuesday episode of Locked On Jets. Well, the NFL draft hopefully went a long way towards fixing the Jets' roster, but you may have a car or truck that you need to fix, and if you do, go to rockauto.com. With the ever-increasing number of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. So why endure pointless or seemingly intimidating questioning and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts on their computer and you know that they're choosing the only brand their warehouse carries? You have computers with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket. And Rock Auto's prices are reliably low for every customer. You can save time and money when using them. And they're a family business. They've been serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years, so they know what they're doing. Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Right locked on in their How Did You Hear About Us box so they know we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. rockauto.com
This is the Locked On Jets podcast on this Tuesday. We are talking about the players the Jets drafted in the NFL draft and the players on the Jets roster who are most impacted by these selections. We've talked about the guys the Jets picked on day one. We've talked about the guys the Jets have picked on day two. Now let's talk about the two fourth round picks the Jets made to close out the 2022 NFL draft. The first was Max Mitchell, a tackle out of Louisiana. He was clearly selected to be a developmental pick on the offensive line. Well, who's he going to replace? This one's pretty obvious. Three years ago, the Jets used a third-round pick on a developmental tackle. It was Chuma Edoga. And the team, I think, had high hopes when they, they actually traded up for Edoga. They traded up one slot to get him. I think there was they were not expecting much in the early stages, but they were hoping he could turn into a decent left tackle. At the time, Kelvin Beecham was the Jets' left tackle, and there were some Beecham comparisons thrown out because Adoga was never really a physical player, but he it seemed like he had the athletic ability to be able to handle the edge and pass protection, which made him a potential left tackle. And as you know, it has not panned out. Adoga has not even turned into a decent swing tackle. I think that that was my hope after year one. It, my I, I kind of lowered my expectations, but even that is clear, Adoga has not met that threshold, I mean, and last year he entered as the number four tackle. The Jets brought in Morgan Moses in the offseason. It was clear they just did not trust Adoga, and with good reason. Adoga's really struggled when he's been on the field for the team. And the thing about being a developmental player is you have to continue to show progress. You have to keep getting better. And through his tenure with the Jets, Adoga has tried hard, but he just has not really developed into a player. He's not a guy you can count on. If the Jets are playing Chuma Adoga for any extended snaps this year, they're going to be in some trouble. So... And you're entering year four here. So it's not so there's been plenty of time for Chuma Adoga to come along. It's an experiment that has not worked. So we move on to the next experiment, which is Max Mitchell. And essentially it's the same principle. He's a guy who, even though he did not do well at the combine, a guy who's viewed as a nimble player, maybe not an overly powerful player. You're hoping at the very least maybe he can develop into a swing tackle, if not more. You know, I'm not sure he's ever going to be a complete player, but somebody who has potential to be a to provide the Jets with some value, very similar to where the Jets were three years ago with the Doga. And maybe this one will work better, but I think Chuma Doga, clearly the odd man out here. And that leaves us with the final pick the Jets made, Michael Clemens. And if you listened yesterday, you know, this was probably the one pick I was not a big fan of that the Jets made in the 2022 NFL draft. Again, I think there's a pretty clear parallel. And this is with a player the Jets selected in the third round two years ago. Jabari Zaniga, and that was a pick I questioned at the time. It seemed like it was really just the Jets trying out a project guy, a guy based on, it was based on pure athletic tools because Zaniga had the requisite skill, the requisite, the requisite athleticism to succeed in the NFL, but he did not really know how to play the defensive end position. The Jets were kind of hoping to bring him along, make him more refined as a player, and it simply has not worked. In fact, he spent much of the season on the practice squad. There really is not much that makes you believe Jabari Zaniga can turn into a good defensive end in this league. I mean, he had, he had, he had his one moment against the Cincinnati Bengals when he was called up from the practice squad in that great win when Mike White threw for 405 yards. The Jets beat the team that won the AFC this year. Zaniga had a sack in that game. Outside of that, though, you've really not seen much that suggests Jabari Zaniga is going to be a good pro. And I think that this was pretty clearly a selection that had replacing Zaniga in mind. This is the new developmental pass rusher the Jets have. They'll try and develop Michael Clemens. Maybe he'll take over that role. And like I said yesterday, when you're talking about Ruckert, when you're talking about Mitchell, and when you're talking about Clemens, you're not going to bat a 1,000 in this stage of the draft. You're just hoping one of the three turns into a good role player. So if Ruckert replaces Wesco and does a good job, or if Mitchell replaces Adoga and turns into the player the Jets hoped Adoga would be, or if Clemens turns into the player the Jets hoped Zaniga would be, this is going to be a successful this is going to be a successful spot in the draft for the Jets. But I think clearly this Jabari Zaniga, who already was kind of on his way out because he did not make the final roster last year. He was relegated to the practice squad for much of the year. Jabari Zaniga is the guy who's likely heading out of town as the result of the Michael Clemens pick. Anyway, that's all for our show today. Thank you so much for listening or watching if you're on YouTube. This has been the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. If you like what you see or hear, hit the subscribe button and you'll never miss an episode. If you're watching on YouTube, please give this episode a big thumbs up. It helps the channel out and it helps other Jets fans find Locked On Jets. Tomorrow, we are going to have our weekly mailbag, so please send in your questions. I can't wait to talk to you then.